<laughs> as I said, uh, as Paul said, I lead the Young Disciples, which is uh, basically a college and career age group. We meet on Friday nights at 7 o'clock, and uh, you don't have to be college or career to join, so if anybody wants to come and join us on Fridays, that would be wonderful. We have a lot of uh, older people, like myself, that go to that, and it's a, really, it's a joy. Um, I'm not sure if I lead the group or they lead me, but I can say this about the young, young people. They're very, very encouraging. I'm going to give you a, a quick illustration of that from even this morning. Um, so I've had a lot of people come up and, and um, say they're praying for me, praying for me, because I haven't had a lot of time to prepare, and I said, I appreciate that. And then one of the young men came up and says, I'm not praying for you, I'm praying for the audience. <laughs> I said, okay, that puts it into perspective and that puts me in my place where I need to be. So all I am really is a sinner saved by grace. And thank you, I won't mention his name, but you might, might figure it out. Thank you for that great uh, word of encouragement. The uh, topic assigned to me is multiplying locally, multiplying locally. Now, all of us here need to think globally. We need to be thinking globally. We need to be thinking about the world and what's going on and the different continents and so on and so forth. But not all of us can be globally, but we're all local. Because local simply means the place that you are. So everybody in this room qualifies for multiplying locally because everybody here is local. We all have an environment in which we live and to which we are responsible. Now, uh, this morning, what I'm going to do, uh, not what I normally do, is I'm going to uh, I'm going to appease um, all the um, engineers, the accountants, and the computer guys. Uh, funny story, that when I first came to this church, I was probably the only guy here that wasn't an engineer, a computer guy, or an accountant. I felt really out of place. I said, I'm an artsy kind of guy. I like, to, I like to move around and think abstractly and all this kind of thing, and and uh, thank God we're starting to get some artsy people in, in the building. But, uh, but I know that to the scientists, which most of the men here are, they love bullet points. In fact, I, I know that to some scientists, bullet points are right next to the Holy Spirit in, in, in importance. And so I'm going to give you some bullet points uh, here uh, this morning. And what I'm going to do is uh, go through a lot of Scripture, okay? So this is normally the way I preach, but... This is what I'm going to do this morning, so um, if you've got a piece of paper, you can write down these bullet points as I go through them, but the idea here will be multiplying locally. Two caveats, okay? Number one, I am not an expert at this. We are all in process together learning how to reach those around us for the gospel. We are all in process. None of us have this down. I certainly do not. I have learned a lot, but I have a long, long way to go. So don't, please don't look at me as an expert. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to look at the Word of God and try to extract principles from the Word of God to show us how we can multiply disciples locally. And uh, number two, what, what I say this morning is not comprehensive. I haven't thought of everything that we need to be thinking about to multiply locally. There are, there are things that I've missed, so please go out after the sermon and think of other ways to do this. Uh, so uh, please understand that as we go into our topic this morning. I want to start out um, with John chapter 6. You say, well, what, what, what's that got to do with multiplying locally? And the reason I've chosen John 6, and I'm going to start with John 6 and I'm going to end with John 6. So turn your Bibles, please, to John 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And I'm going to read the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I understand it's a historical narrative, and it's got really nothing about multiplying locally. 
However, it does have a lot to do with multiplying because Jesus multiplies something out of nothing. And that's exactly how I'm going to end the sermon is that basically multiplying is the work of God. We have a part to play, but Jesus Christ, if he's not in the middle of it, will, will uh, uh, leave us uh, without uh, any results. Verse 1 of chapter 6, after these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw signs which he had performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that we may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and a couple small fish, but what are they among so many? And then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down and in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. And so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up, filled 12 baskets, more than what they began with, filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who was to come into the world. Let us pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we come before thee uh, this, this morning, this glorious morning, this fall morning. We just love you, Lord. We just want to learn we come here with our, with our mouths open wide. Our hunger is evident. We want to know how we can better serve you and glorify your name and magnify your name by multiplying disciples locally right here where we are at in Centennial, Colorado, Southside Bible Church. So, Lord, please use me, a humble servant, to give out some of these principles whereby we can cling to them and do them and obey them and be good multipliers. The Word of God. God, we thank you so much for all that you've done in this church to, to see some of these principles being affected and enacted. We, we love how you're bringing in many friends and relatives and others at the workplace and are coming in and are he hearing the word of God and some are being saved. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you that this church is alive. So we're not just speaking from a, a tomb here. We're, we're speaking from a living orgasm or organism rather. And Father, we thank you again for all that you're doing in our lives, and we pray now you bless our time together in Jesus' name, amen. All right, John chapter 6 is, of course, the feeding of the 5,000. So I'm going to give you eight principles by which I believe uh, I've come up with uh, that we can employ to multiply locally. Number one, probably uh, maybe the most important, these were in no particular order. Number one, discipling individually discipling individually. Now, discipleship is a buzzword around here at Southside Bible Church, but I wonder sometimes if we really understand what we're talking about. Discipleship is not programs. Discipleship is not techniques. Discipleship is not some impersonal, uh, distant teaching uh, from a rooftop and hoping that somehow some people will get caught with the, the virus of discipleship and go out and do something. Discipleship is nothing like that. It doesn't produce anything. Multiplication happens when one person 
invests his life into the life of another person. That's what discipleship is. We are learning to do this here, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It takes a lot of effort, and sometimes it takes a lot of money. Discipling uh, takes uh, uh, a lot of exhaustion. It, it puts us at a place where we are often intruded upon, something we as Americans don't like. It causes us to be inconvenienced, something else that Americans don't like. It takes place only when people are comfortable enough to come to you with their deepest struggles of life, and it also is where you can be vulnerable to them and show them that you are not as together as they thought you were. Discipleship comes when one life is poured into another. Now, part of it is didactic. Part of it is teaching, no doubt. But it's far beyond that. And so when we look and think about discipleship, we think, of course, immediately of the Apostle Paul. And so I want to turn your attention to what I really feel is the, is the paradigm verse for discipleship. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. I want to read that. You can go along with me. I'm reading the New King James only because that's the Bible I know. I know most of you don't use that, so try to follow along as I read. I'm looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. This is the Apostle Paul talking to his, his disciple, if you will, his protege, Timothy. Notice what Paul says. Now, of course, he's comparing Timothy to these uh, magicians, Janus and Jambres, who resisted the truth. And then he says, Timothy, you're not like that. Why are you not like that? And here's the reason. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. In other words, Timothy, I taught you and you learned well. But it doesn't stop there. Manner of life. Manner of life. How do you know someone's manner of life unless you're living with them or they with you? How do they know your manner of life unless they see you in many different contexts of life? They don't. Purpose. How do you know someone's purpose unless you see the way they are driven, the direction in which they walk? What jazzes you? What gets you up in the morning? What moves you forward? That has to be seen and can only be seen when you're with somebody. His faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, and afflictions. All of these things, I submit to you, beloved, are things that can only be seen where there is a careful, purposeful, one by one pouring one's life into another. Now, I know what you're immediately thinking. I can't do that for a lot of people, and that's exactly right. You can't. So what we need to start to understand is discipling one, maybe two. You can't disciple everybody. Not, not like this. You'd be, you'd be in a, a Looney Tunes asylum if you were to try to do this. No, no. You, you find people or they find you and you start to pour your life into them. And you say, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm a housewife. Disciple your kids. What am I supposed to do? um, I'm at home on my computer working all day. Disciple somebody in the church. There's always people out there that need to be discipled. And from my limited experience as I talk to the young people, almost every one of them wants to be discipled. I remember a, a, a conversation I had, what, about two months ago with the young guys, and I went around the room and I asked all of them, says, have you been discipled? And some of them said they had, and some of them said they hadn't. But the second question I had was, do you want to be discipled? And it was unanimous. Yes, I want to be discipled. They are out there. They are looking for those older men and women in the faith that will pour their lives into them. Now, we have many people that are doing this. This is not a chastisement. This is, let's continue on what we're now doing. 
we're moving in the right direction. But there are some here, perhaps, that don't do this. And I would like to push you along a little bit. You are able, you are able to disciple if you live a consistent Christian life to any degree. You don't have to know the argument of the book of Hosea. You don't have to know what the hypostatic union is. What you do need to know is, I love Jesus, and I want to show you how I live, and I'm going to show you my failings and foibles, and you can watch my life, and I'm going to pour into you. We have one, uh, one uh, family in the church, again, left unnamed. They know who they are. They leave their door open for the young people. Now, most of us aren't going to do that. I had one young guy said, I just walk into their house and go into the refrigerator and I start eating. <laughs> now, that's rare, but I don't think it's wrong. Well, isn't it amazing that you can have people in the church that actually say, our house is open. The door is not a prison door. It's, it is a door of invitation. Swing it open, come in, and see how we live. Boy, what, what, uh, how that would change the world of Christians were like that. I think in third world countries, they're more like that. The door is always open. In America, we have TV, air conditioning, and computers. It keeps us in the house, and we don't want nobody bugging us. That is not going to aid and abet discipleship. It's not going to do it. Is your door open to others? I'm not saying 24-7, we need our time. I get that. But is it ever open? That's the question. So, discipling individually. I'm not talking about discipling, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people. Sometimes we say, well, I'll just disciple everybody. That never works. That's just pie-in-the-sky nonsense. Are you discipling anybody? That's the question I want you to answer even this morning. Secondly, tar targeting specifically. Targeting specifically. Not only would you disciple one-on-one, -on -one, but often it takes wisdom to choose that person or people to whom you feel discipling is most needed or that is most warranted. You don't have to disciple everybody the same. Uh, in my position, sometimes it's like I'll disciple the men that, that show interest in teaching. I can't disciple every one of the 55 or 60 young disciples. I can't do it. I'm one guy. But I can target some men specifically to disciple. Uh, text for that, Acts chapter 18. So, turn your Bibles back there. Let's look at a couple named Aquila and Priscilla as they were dealing with a young man named Apollos. Verse 24, Acts 18, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. So, here's a guy that's got a lot of talent, knows the Scriptures, mighty in the Scriptures. He probably was a, a good speaker. It says he was eloquent. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. So, he had, he had the fervency for the gospel. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, I'm not going to get into that right now, but he didn't have a complete gospel. We'll just leave it at that. So, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Thank God for Aquila and Priscilla. They see a man with potential, they pull him aside, they disciple him, I don't know how long, and then they say, okay, you're ready to go to Corinth. They send him off to Corinth where he disciples the uh, folk there and really aids and abets the gospel in that community. We are to target specifically. Again, this isn't like a, an open a nebulous thing, just disciple everybody and anybody you can. You'll, like I say, you'll go crazy. You can't do that. We are all limited. But, but saying, I see something in you, I'd like to disciple you, a young man, a young lady, whoever, um, we are to the target 
uh, people specifically to disciple. This, again, is happening in this church. I hope it happens even some more. Number three, inviting diligently. Number three, inviting diligently. So we have discipling individually, targeting specifically, and inviting diligently. Now, I'll be the first to admit evangelism is hard. People say, oh, you go out there and evangelist, evangelize on campus, and I tell people, you have no idea how much I'm shaking in my boots every time I do it. I say, I don't even know what to say to half these people. I have no idea if uh, most of the time I've done any good at all. Evangelism is not easy. Not everybody, I, I, I would concede, not everybody is gifted as that kind of evangelism. As a matter of fact, I'd even propose that not everybody is actually gifted at bringing people to Christ. But everybody in this room, everybody has the ability to invite. What's hard about an invitation? Matter of fact, that's what the gospel is. Isn't that why the gospel is wonderful? Because it's not a command, it's not a demand, it's not an intricate set of rules you have to keep, it's an invitation. Come as you are, come all you are labor and a heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And same with, same with uh, multiplying locally. If you do nothing else, start to invite. Uh, I can put a plug in for Fridays, but I also pl- put a plug in for Sunday mornings. People that come here are not going to get beat up. So if you're worried about your relative getting beat up or people saying, you know, what's wrong with you or I don't like that tattoo or I don't like the way you dress or you smell or anything like that, that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, when people walk in here, especially on Friday night, if they stay more than 10 minutes, they will hear the gospel. I am so proud of the young people. I guess I get to boast a bit on them even because I've got the pulpit. I might as well, right? Take advantage of what I can take advantage of. But people, when they walk in, and there are visitors every week. I mean, I'm not too good at inviting, but they're really good at it. And I want to encourage young people, keep inviting. But I want to encourage middle-aged and older people, invite. Invite friends, invite relatives, invite people at the grocery store. What harm does it cause? Hey, come to our Sunday service. Come to Friday night. Come to my community group. Whatever it might be, we should be a church that's inviting diligently. And therefore, you have at least put somebody under the hearing of the gospel. Maybe you couldn't do it. Maybe for whatever reason, you didn't feel comfortable. Maybe you didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, feel like there was any kind of... uh, uh, relationship going on with this particular person, whatever it might be. But you can always invite. There is no cost to inviting. Uh, text for that, John chapter 12. I love, I love uh, Philip and Andrew and some of these guys. Uh, they were not uh, the brightest lights, I don't think, in the room, but, but they knew one thing. They knew Jesus had the answers, and they knew that if they got people to Jesus... They were doing what they needed to do. Are you about bringing people to Jesus? So I, I'm, I'm not real eloquent. I, I don't know the gospel well enough. I don't know the answers to all their questions. I get that, I get that, I get that, I get that. Can you say, can you come to our service? Can you come to our community group, our Friday night, whatever it might be? Now, there were certain Greeks, verse 20, among those who came to worship at the feast, Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, Philip, he didn't quite know what to do, so Philip came, and, you know, this is the inner circle kind of thing, and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And then he goes on, talks about a grain of wheat. Unless it dies and falls into the ground, it doesn't produce. He talks about the cross. Whether these Greeks actually ever saw Jesus or not, I'm not sure. But one thing I do know is that Andrew, Philip, and then Andrew knew enough at least to bring them to Jesus or at least tell Jesus about them. They were about inviting. And so I just want to encourage you today, invite people to come to the hearing of the gospel. If you could do nothing else, you can do that. 
Everybody in this room can do that. It's not brain surgery. Come to my, unless you're embarrassed. If you're embarrassed by the church, then find a different one. But if you're not, invite them. Because the people here will, will love on them like no other place I've ever been. Same with Fridays, same with the community groups. So please, invite diligently. You want to multiply locally? Invite diligently. Number four, witnessing concentrically. Now, that is a word. I have a hard time saying it, but it's the only word that actually works. Concentric circles. You know what that is. You got a dot in the middle. You got a, a circle that's a little bit around it, then a bigger circle, and a bigger circle, and a bigger circle. You could use the word outwardly if you prefer, witnessing outwardly, but I like concentrically better, even though it's hard to say. Now, there's an old adage in baseball that says, um, you need to get the first base before you get the home plate. And, and a lot of people in the church, and I've been like this before, are always thinking about the home run. We're thinking about all the people in North Africa or the people in Kenya, the, well, all, the, all the suffering saints in China or whatever it is. We, we're thinking globally and we'll pray for that. But I think the way that we multiply locally is by witnessing concentrically, which means witnessing to those that are closest to us and then moving out from there. And I think sometimes we forget about that because it's more convenient, or should I say easier, to just pray for the missionaries out there somewhere. But I don't believe that that's our first calling. This is how um, the Thessalonian church operated. We'll look at, we'll look at that uh, in a further point. But for this, I would like to turn your attention to Mark chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Mark chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 says this. And this is the healing of the, of the demoniac, the demon-possessed man. I'm not going to get into the whole story. You can start with verse 1 if you'd like to later on. But Jesus has healed this man, and of course, everybody with the swine story, they all want Jesus to get out. He's ruining their economy. And it's funny, the gospel sometimes ruins economies, which is fine. And when he got into the boat, verse 18, that's Jesus, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Oh, Jesus, I want to just be with you. You're the guy that healed me. That'll be great to sit in the boat and walk around Palestine with the guy that healed me. That'd be wonderful. And we expect Jesus to say, yeah, what a wonderful thing. Come, come with me. But he doesn't say that. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. When you're converted, you're converted into a context. It might be marriage with family, it might be no family, it might be in the context of a workplace. So when I was saved in 1978, I was saved because somebody took the time to open the Bible to me at work, and so I had two ministries. I had my family who were unconverted and remained that way, and I had everybody in work. And I didn't know any better. I just said, I'm going to tell everybody about Jesus. I, wasn't, I didn't even know what missions was. I wasn't thinking about people in North Africa. I had no idea what was going on. But I did know that the guy sitting next to me or the gal or my mom or dad or sisters or brother, they needed Jesus. And so when we're saved... We immediately become missionaries, but not kind of in that nebulous say, well, I'm just a missionary. You know, Wesley said, the world is my parish. Well, Wesley said some things that I don't agree with. The world's not your parish. Your parish is where you're living. You've got grandkids, kids, work, co-workers. You've got relatives. You've got people right here at Southside Bible that need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you start. And then you can move out from there, like in concentric circles. 
It's like when you throw the pebble in the lake and you see that first ring, and then eventually it goes out from there weaker and weaker until it hits the shore. The strength is right next to the pebble. That's where you should be ministering. Don't ever use the excuse, well, I don't minister to my neighbors because I'm ministering, I'm supporting a missionary in Baghdad or something like that. You should be ministering where you are at, where God has placed you in your particular context of life. The greatest movement probably of the gospel, aside from Acts 2 and the New Testament, I would argue would be the Reformation. Uh, The Reformation was not a worldwide movement. At least it didn't start that way. Luther didn't write the 95 Theses and say, I'm going to win the world. In fact, he had no idea what he was doing, to be honest with you. He just tacked those things up in Latin to debate them. He didn't have any idea what was going to happen. But actually, what ended up happening was Luther got saved in the process. And uh, let me read to you from uh, Scott Manich's little uh, 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 chapter on the legacy of Luther. Let me read something to you here. Luther's strong character and solid courage and dynamic theological leadership, to say nothing of his clear exposition of the Christian scriptures, attracted a company of capable and loyal supporters who proved to be instrumental in promoting the evangelical cause in electoral Saxony and throughout the Roman Empire, Holy Roman Empire. Many of Luther's first allies, disciples, were men under 30, that means a lot to me, who had been trained in humanistic studies, wrongly, and were committed to the reform of the Christian church to the recovery of the biblical language, the careful exegesis of Scripture and regular Christian preaching. The institutional center of this reform program was the University of Wittenberg, where in 1517 Luther and his faculty colleagues instituted curricular reforms that replaced scholastic theology with biblical studies and established faculty chairs in Greek and Hebrew. Thanks to these curricular reforms, that is basically a fancy way of saying getting the gospel in all different curricula, as well as Luther's public fame, the University of Wittenberg quickly grew to become one of the largest universities in the German Empire. From the from the faculty of that one university. You see, Luther did not start the Reformation alone. We give him a little bit too much credit, I think. He did not start the Reformation alone. What he did was faithfully witness to all of the other professors at Wittenberg, and one by one, they started getting saved. It's amazing what God did. And it was through a, a, uh, a plurality of witnesses going out of Wittenberg that the Reformation happened. For example, Nicholas von Amsdorf, you may have heard the name, he left to become a pastor at Magdeburg where there was another breakout of, of uh, Reformed doctrine. Justice Jonas, he was a man that accompanied Luther to his uh, time at Worms in 1521 became a dean of the Faculty of Theology at Wittenberg, another great, strong uh, preacher of the gospel. Johannes Bergenhagen, he read Luther's Babylonian captivity of the church and was mesmerized by it and said, quote, the entire world is blind, this man alone sees truth. And of course, in 1518, somebody you have heard of, Philip Melanchthon, came along and he he was strictly a humanist scholar. He knew Greek better than I know English. But he didn't know the Lord. And through the careful exposition and discipleship of Luther, he got saved. And all these men and many more contributed to the Reformation. And one other thing about Luther, it's good to know. How did he eat dinner? Just him and Katie sitting around a table? You know this, Pastor. No, he had students all around him. And they they called Luther's table talks. And he just talked... Anything, not only theology, you know, how to bake cookies, I don't know, anything that was, anything that was going on. They wanted to, because he wanted them to see who he was. And Luther was kind of a rough-hewn guy. He used salty language. At times, he didn't like Jews. He has all kinds of issues. But guess what? The students loved him because he was real. 
And from that, from that little living room in Wittenberg and from the faculty at Wittenberg, the Reformation went forward. So, what am I trying to say? What happens here at Southside Bible when we get a lot of young people and older people all excited about the gospel, and what do they do next? Then they start going out. The grocery store, at work, down to the park, down to the campuses, wherever it might be, and they're preaching the gospel everywhere. I love, I love Acts chapter 8. It's one of my favorite passages, and I'm just going to read it. It just came to my mind, but I'm going to read it anyway because it's one of my favorite passages. Now, Paul was consenting to death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered. That's all the Christians throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation uh, over him and so on and so forth. Verse 4, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They were discipled by the apostles, evidently, and then through persecution, they were forced to scatter. I hope persecution never forces this church to scatter. I hope we scatter voluntarily. Be a lot easier system, a lot less painless. I'll get on that some other time. We need to be out preaching, teaching, loving, discipling, showing people what the Christian life's about, being vulnerable, being honest, being passionate, witnessing concentrically. Number five, praying evangelically, or if you have trouble with that word, I'm having trouble with all these L-Y words, praying evangelistically. I don't care, either one's fine. In other words, our prayers, not only, but our prayers ought to be about the gospel going out. This is exactly what Whitfield and Wesley committed to do in the Holy Club in the 18th century. They got together, was it Cambridge or Oxford? I can't remember which one. They got together and they just started praying specifically for different groups. But they didn't only pray. What did they pray for? They prayed for themselves. Here's one of my pet peeves. Again, I, I get to vent a little bit. I don't get too many chances to do that. I think one of the things that I hear a lot, and I do it too, so I'm guilty, is people say, well, pray for my relatives that they get saved. Pray for my sister, my brother, my coworker, my this, my that, my other thing. That's all great. Is that how the Bible actually wants us to pray? That's my question. Well, I understand Paul, Romans 9, Romans 10. I wish that all my, my, uh, my brothers in, in Judaism were saved and I'd, I'd, be, I'd go to hell for them and all that. I get that. But, but you think about the Apostle Paul, he didn't just sit around and pray for the Jews. He went out and got bombarded by them and witnessed to them quite a bit. I want to I look at, uh, I wanna look at uh, a couple texts here with you. Acts chapter 4, I want to show you that the way we should be praying might be a little bit different than the way we do pray. And I want to look at Acts 4, Peter and John are arrested, they heal this guy and so on, you know the story. <clears throat> I'm just going to read a few verses, uh, verse 13, then I'll go down uh, to verse 23. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So, wh what, are, what characterizes these apostles' boldness? Verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own uh, companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they were kind of on a trial. And when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. In other words, persecution, what's the difference? God has created all of it. He's, he's our protector. If he's created the earth, the heavens, the seas, what are we worried about? Then he quotes Psalm 2, why do the nations raise and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth shook their, uh, I'm sorry, took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord 
and against his Christ. We expect to be persecuted. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with uh, the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand uh, and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants what? That they might be saved? Well, certainly that's on their mind, but that's not what they're praying for. That with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word with boldness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. I want you, I want you to see these texts. This, this is convicting, earth-shattering to my own soul. For you yourselves, verse 1 of chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had suffered before, was spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. They were being persecuted. And what did they need in the middle of persecution? A nice escape route? A nice way to to kind of make the message a little bit less threatening and get everybody to like me? No, they prayed for boldness in their God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. We love the whole armor of God, don't we? And we need to put it on daily. But let's see what uh, Paul talks about with the praying aspect. Praying, verse 18 <clears throat> always with all prayer and supplication of spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. This is the one time he prays for himself. And for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. It's scary when I pray for myself to be bold because I don't like it. It's hard. I don't like people saying, you're a knucklehead or spit at you, or no one's ever spit at me, but, but gainsayed me and, and called me other names, if you've ever been downtown. Don't like it. What I like to do is say, Lord, save my sisters. That's easy. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's easy. How be be bold. How about be bold with your neighbor, bold with the person at church, bold with your mom, dad, sister, brother, workmate, or whatever. Boldness is what the church needs. We need prayer, yes, but pray for yourself that you'll actually open your mouth. You want to multiply locally, you have to open your mouth. Another pet peeve. I do not like this saying. Preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. That is not true. Preach the gospel only, always, by using words. Nobody has ever been saved by Rick being a nice guy. Never happened. No one's ever been saved by Rick mowing someone's lawn or buying their groceries. Now, it might lead to conversation that they might see your good works and glorify your fathers, and I get that. But the way people are saved is by the gospel, the gospel of God, the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You must open your mouth. Well, I'm just nice to everybody. I know a lot of Muslims and others of other religions that are very nice. That doesn't do it. They just see you as a nice person. Praying evangelically or evangelistically, praying for boldness in your own life. Number six, thinking ecclesiastically. The great 
instrument of multiplication is class, the local church will always be, has always been, and will always be the instrument, the great instrument of multiplying locally. The Apostle Paul planted churches, strengthened churches, wrote to churches, visited churches, encouraged churches, rebuked churches, loved churches. One thing he never did was abandon the church. How I hear this so often, I'm just going to go out and minister on my own. I can't, I just can't stand the people down there at the church. I don't like the elders. I don't like the people in the pew. I don't like the Sunday school program, the curtains. I don't like the TV monitor, whatever you don't like. And they leave. They have left the one place that God has ordained for multiplying the gospel. It has to be the local church. It's equipped, and only it is equipped to do it. I'm not opposed to parachurch ministries. I have done FCA. I, I work uh, prison fellowship. When I go to the prison, there are places the church can't get. Parachurches get there. But let me say this. The parachurches need to be funneling people into the local body. They're not autonomous. They're not an end unto themselves. It's the local church with pastors and deacons and people in the pews and sermons and communion and baptism and all the other things that we do. If you're not in the local church, get in one and learn to love it. Love it until you love it. I know it's hard. People, people know me. I can be the most critical guy in the face of the planet. But I must learn to, look, I learn, must learn to love the local church because it's the only place that I will ever prosper and multiply the gospel locally. See, Southside Bible is here, and it's wonderful. We're ministering North Africa and so on. And unfortunately, we're in a business park, so it doesn't, it's not conducive to neighborhoods, but we do still have people around us that this church needs to be outreaching. And how that happens, we have to work that out each individually. Now, let me read for you 1 Thessalonians again, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse, uh, let's start with verse 6. So, what I'm trying to prove here is uh, thinking ecclesiastically, thinking about the church, the body of Christ being the sending agent, being the power, the force, the foundation, the raison d'etre, whatever you want to call it, of missions, local missions especially. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you became examples to who? All in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. In other words, the first place that the Thessalonians impacted was their own local province, Macedonia, and then south of there, Achaia. They're not thinking about Jerusalem or Rome or Spain or whatever. That's where their hub was. That was where the light was shining out of. And everybody around that area was starting to see the gospel. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. The word of the Lord. They were preaching everywhere. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, so that's not the end, right? We don't, it's not just the local. But in every place, your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. If there's, if there's ever a time we don't have to speak, it's when somebody says, hey, Paul, do you hear what's going on in Thessalonica? Everybody there's changed. They're preaching this gospel about someone named Jesus. At that point, you don't have to say anything. That's okay not to say anything to that. But what you can't not say anything about is the gospel. That's what they were preaching. So they went out from Macedonia, Achaia, and then throughout all the region. How far, I don't know. It seems like people from everywhere Paul went, they said, man, those people from Thessalonica, they're crazy. All they talk about is Jesus. What's wrong with these people? Isn't there anything else? 
Paul says, no, then really is it. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be something if they said, Southside Bible? Yeah, I've heard about that. All they do is talk about Jesus over there. All they talk about is Jesus. All they talk about is salvation by grace through faith in someone named Jesus. I can't get them to talk about the Broncos, the Avalanche, uh, politics. Who cares? They talk about Jesus. Think ecclesiastically. Think about the church being the place, the springboard from which this gospel goes out and multiplies locally. I am more convicted than anybody in this room, so <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not saying I've got this figured out. I don't. Every one of these points is born from failure. <clears throat> Number seven, discipling individually, targeting specifically, inviting diligently, witnessing concentrically, praying evangelically, thinking ecclesiastically. Number seven, evaluating truthfully. Oh, yes, you knew I was going to get to that. It does matter what the instrument is, doesn't it? We need to be looking at our own lives before we figure out how to preach the gospel that changes other people's lives. Now, by saying that, I am not saying you need to be perfect. I'm not even getting close to saying that. I'm not saying that you need to have all your theology down. I'm not saying that you need to have this great uh, charismatic personality. I'm not saying that you have to have everything in line. Oh, I do devotions with my family every night, and I read the Bible three hours. I pray for four. I got that all down. Now I'll go. Over. I'm not saying that. I don't do that. How can I tell you to do that? But what I am saying is to have a genuine evaluation of who you are. And what I always tell the young people, and maybe I get rebuked for this, but I say Christianity is not a religion of sinlessness. It's a religion of constant repenting for sin. It's the sensitivity that I daily fall short, and I'm down on my knees or standing up, whatever, and saying, Lord, I fell short again. Help me. I repent of this sin. Help me to go on. I want to turn your attention to the 51st Psalm. I just always love this because that is the Psalm of repentance, right? But it's, it's, it's interesting to me, and again, most of you already know this. This is all review, I'm sure, that uh, as he's repenting, cleanse me with hyssop, I shall be clean. You know, this is after the uh, sin with Bathsheba and killing Uriah and all the other things that he did. He says in verse 10, here's the apostle, I was going to say the apostle, I'm always saying the apostle Paul, like he wrote everything. No, this is David. He says in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I wonder if that's your daily prayer. This stuff about, oh, I, yeah, man, I didn't, I didn't sin today. What a bunch of garbage. Can I give you the, the bar you need to jump over? You need to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you've done that, you're dismissed. You don't need anything more that I'm saying. Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence as he did with Saul. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Fortunately, God doesn't do that in the New Covenant, but he did it back then. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. If you know me well, you know that's my chief prayer. Lord, joy in you, joy in you, joy in you. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Look at verse 13. Then, then, then. I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. By understanding your own sinfulness and the remedy, repentance to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, now qualifies you to go out and witness to the world. The world doesn't want to hear how good you are. They could give a rip. 
They want to know how good the forgiving Savior is. That's all they need to hear. I don't go out and promote my own life. I mean, because people start probing too deep, they go, whoa, who are you to tell me how to live? Fortunately, I don't tell them how to live. I tell them about Jesus. Evaluating yourself truthfully helps you to multiply locally. If you don't know where you are in your own heart, you're not going to be able to reach other people. Then I will teach transgressors. After all the dealings with God for my sin, trusting in the Lord, doing all the stuff that I'm supposed to be, then, God, I know I'm qualified to go out and teach sinners about Jesus Christ and His so great salvation. Evaluating truthfully, and lastly, number eight, if you're taking notes, if you're a computer person or a engineer or, or like Taylor, an accountant, I've got the numbers right. Number eight, this is correct. Watching engagingly. Now you say, well, what in the world does that mean? Watching what engagingly? I, I deliberately gave... Um, a paradox. Because to multiply locally, two things have got to happen. We have to be good watchers. We have to watch what the Lord is doing because He does the doing. One plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. We need to, to watch what God is doing and give the credit for all that is done to Him. Oh, so many good things happening in disciples. Thank you for that. Give praise to God. He's doing it. Great things happening at Southside Bible. Well, that Pastor Murphy or Pastor Dave, they, these guys are wonderful. Give praise to God. Um, we're to watch what God's doing and, and roll with the punches. We are to, um, we are to get in the current and find out where God's moving and just follow Him. But we are also to watch engagingly. That is to say, we watch as we're busy. So what does that mean? Uh, it means the same thing that the, uh, uh, the author of Hebrews, I don't know if you ever... Uh, ever, ever saw the tension here, um, he says, um, um, let us therefore be diligent, this is 411 of Hebrews, to enter the rest. You say, wait a minute. Entering the rest means I don't do anything, and he says, be diligent to rest. Paradox. What I'm saying is that if you want to multiply locally, you need to watch engagingly. That is, watch what God's doing and be engaged while you're watching. So let's go back to, let's go back to John chapter 6, where we started. See, we like to think we're in control. You want to kill a ministry? Think that you're in control. It'll die quicker than an ant under my shoe. We're not. John chapter 6, I'm not going to read it again. I want you to notice that there are three things that Jesus says in this whole narrative, three things. The first one is he tests the apostles. Where shall we buy bread, verse 5, that we may eat? That's a test. In other words, what he's getting at is, you can't. <laughs> He's driving them to complete despair. God must drive us to complete despair before we can multiply. Because we can't do it. My greatest sin, perhaps, because I'm a doer, is beginning to cross that line to think that what I'm doing is producing something. And that's dangerous. Where shall we eat that we... Rick, what could you possibly do? 
to multiply locally? Nothing? The second thing that Jesus do, did, does, did, whatever, verse 10, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. I love that. Drives you to despair. And then he says, I got this under control. Sit them down. I got the organization all figured out. I know what I'm about to do. You sit them down. You bring some order to this mess. You do something, and it doesn't always seem like the thing to do, right? Sit them down. Okay, Jesus, now what, right? Sit, make the people sit down. I think it's in Mark. It said they were in companies of 50 or something like that. And then the third thing he said, <laughs> after the miracle has been performed, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. In other words, just collect the proceeds from the miracle. You get to enjoy what's left, and it's more than we started with, because I am God, I produce disciples, I produce bread and fish out of nothing. The one that brings bread and fish to existence is God and God alone. Am I undoing my entire message and multiplying locally? No. But what I am saying that everything I've just said to this point cannot be put into a system. And if I do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I will get results. No, it's God and God alone that produces. You might, multiply, you might try to multiply for the rest of your life in God, like you said to Isaiah, you nothing until the earth is, the land is destroyed. Nothing. But go out and do it anyway. God is so kind, however, that more often than not, he will give us fruit. He's a kind God. So like Philip, we ought to look at our resources and we should despair. But we should know this, that God always has a plan. But he doesn't expect us to sit back and do nothing. In fact, I'll guarantee you this. If we do nothing, we're going to get nothing. So let me talk to three groups and then I'm done. It all has to do with multiplication. I'm not a scientist, but I did, I did pass second grade math, so I do know something. The only number you can't multiply with is what? Say again, Charles? Zero. zero. Doesn't work. Can't multiply with zero. It means it's, a meaningless, it's a meaningless concept. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're zero. You can't multiply anything. And you shouldn't. What you need is Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your sins, believe the gospel, and beg God to use you as you look to his son. You don't want to be zero. The second number that is probably what you don't want to be, and this is for believers, you don't want to be a one. Because every time you multiply with one, you end up with the same thing. You end up being back on yourself. It's all about me. I multiply by one, I get me. Big deal. I don't want to be a one either. Some of us, maybe me, have often lived like ones. Yeah, we multiply, but it's all about me. You know, it's better than nothing, I suppose, but it certainly doesn't answer the call, does it? No? You want to be anything but a zero? That means you're not even in the ball game, or a one, which means you're getting no results. You want to be a two or above. Some of us might be twos, some threes. I don't have no idea. I'm not an evaluator of talent. So I pray today as we close this session that if you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll hasten to him now and don't try to multiply anybody. Don't tell them the gospel unless you know it yourself. I want to get at those that maybe have done very little 
and say, you can start doing something today. That's the beauty of the gospel. God never says, well, I can't use you anymore because you haven't, you haven't done anything for 30 years. I can't use you. God never says that. You can start right now and start multiplying with the gifts and graces that God has given you. What I would like to encourage all of you, whether you're from Southside Bible or whatever church, is to be something above a one and live your life focused on multiplying the gospel locally in your own sphere. Shall I review and then pray? Disciple individually. Target specifically. Invite diligently. Witness concentrically. Pray evangelically. Think ecclesiastically. Evaluate truthfully. And watch engagingly. Lord, be praised that we have a great God who's in the business of saving souls and he's using the likes of me to do it. Father, I pray that you would just help us not to feel beat down or anything like that. That's not the purpose. That encourage us that if we begin to have a focus on, on multiplying locally, that you will come. One will plant, one will water, but that you will give the increase. God, help us now. We need a lot of help. We're a weak people. We're a needy people. But we know that you're a great God, and you give us all that we need to do the task that you have set before us right here in Centennial, Denver metro area. You've given us everything we need. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross for our sins and for giving us the desire to see others around us come to know you. And may that now be fulfilled in our prayers by your sovereign, gracious work on their hearts. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Rick. That was an excellent message, excellent challenges. I want to focus on the application for a minute. The church has uh, evangelistic outreach on a consistent basis. Um, that is announced in advance. Sometimes it's downtown, sometimes it's out at the School of Mines. If you want to participate in that, uh, you're not necessarily going to get thrown in um, up front. You can go along and watch, learn, listen participate, see how it's done, and hopefully your faith will grow until you can be the person that is uh, making those approaches and talking to people. I um, want to bring your attention to the new missions wall that we have out in the lobby. Um, if you have a smartphone, you can scan the QR code and it will give you the information about the families that we support around the world. Um, so you can take a look at that, get to learn a little bit more about the missions ministry here at Southside. Um, tomorrow will be uh, Peter Fan uh, during the Sunday school hour. Um, that starts at 9 o'clock, and all Sunday schools will be meeting in here for that session tomorrow, 9 o'clock, Peter Fan. And then Ken will be closing the conference uh, with the regular service with his... Um, message and just want to thank you again for coming out today invite you to lunch uh, for those folks of you who registered thank you um, you're all invited to lunch even if you didn't register uh, the only uh, concern that we would have and favor that we would ask is for those of you who didn't register would wait until those folks who did register have gone through the line so let's close uh, this morning's session uh, thank you to the speakers um, Pray for Rodney and his family. Uh, pray God's continued blessing and multiplication of his ministry where he is at and God's protection for them as well. And um, pray, pray for the Lord's uh, continued blessing upon the end of the conference as we uh, head into tomorrow and enjoy our time of fellowship here after uh, this morning's session. So let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for uh, your grace. Thank you that at one time people were faithful enough to share the gospel with us. Um, we remember those people with great affection, their boldness, their love, uh, the spirit of Christ within them. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, set aside our fear, uh, that you would bless us with courage and the affection uh, for the loss and heart for them, knowing what their eternal destiny is if they don't hear the gospel and respond to it accordingly. Lord, uh, we ask your continued blessing upon our day, that you would bless our food uh, to the nourishment of our bodies, uh, bless us in the edification of the fellowship and time that we spend together. May you continue to uh, move the works along in the hearts that you've begun with this conference to fruition at some point in the future. Whether it's to call somebody overseas or to call uh, somebody into a supporting sending ministry, um, we trust you, Lord, that your name will be glorified and you will work those uh, uh, paths and uh, sovereign uh, things that you have determined uh, to the glory of your name. So we thank you again. Thank you for our, for our salvation, for your son and his death on the cross. And may you bless us as we go forth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You're dismissed for lunch.